In the first part of the lecture, the general principles of chemical signaling have been considered. In this second part of the lecture, we are going to learn the main examples of the chemical signaling operation, the action of hormones produced by endocrine system. At first, we need to consider general characteristics of hormones, mainly the mechanisms of their action. And then we will learn hypothalamus and pituitary system that controls many other endocrine glands. Let's begin. At this picture you can see the main endocrine glands of the body. Hormones released by these glands into blood then are transported by blood flow to their target cells, then bind the receptors of these cells and perform their effects which can include regulation of homeostasis, growth and development processes, reproduction and utilization of energy. In addition to these main endocrine organs, there are numerous other organs and tissues that possess endocrine functions. Some examples of these hormones are given in this table. Most of these hormones we are going to consider with when considering corresponding sections of the course of normal physiology. For example, the atrial natiuretic hormone we are going to consider in blood circulation regulation and also in excretory system. Then leptin, for example, is going to be considered in metabolism and energy part of physiology. And the <coughs> digestive hormones such as gastrin, secretin, and cholecystokinin. Also, we are going to consider in the digestive system physiology. For the general characteristics of hormones, first we need to specify the mechanisms of their action. And here, if you have already learned the chemical signaling mechanisms, you may find many familiar sequences and pathways. First, you can see that hormones may act through plasma membrane receptors, and they can use seven transmembrane segment receptors and predominantly the main two pathways. I hope they already are familiar for you. Adenylate cyclase and CAMP pathway and phospholipase C and inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol pathway. Then hormones may use one transmembrane segment receptors. If, if you remember, I, I hope that you remember that plasma membrane receptors are designed for the hydrophilic hormones, which are dissolved in water and not, cannot be dissolved in lipids or phospholipids or membrane and therefore they cannot pass inside the cell and they need to use these receptors. For hormones of the lipophilic nature the <coughs> receptors are located inside the cell and so another type of hormones acts through intracellular receptors and both of them can be used cytosolic or nuclear. If you look again at this classification you may notice that it's almost coincides with the classification of molecular receptors considered in chemical signaling. But there is a certain difference. The plasma membrane receptors group included three types, 7-TMS, 1-TMS and ligand-gated ion channels. As you can see, here ligand-gated ion channels are absent. It's because hormones mostly do not use these receptors. And Ligands for ligand-gated channels belong to the group of neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine or it can be, for example, glutamate or gamma aminobutyric acid and so on. Neurotransmitters are released not into blood but into the area of synapses, into the synaptic cleft of synapses. So, you see, the classification is practically repeated with just absence of ligand-gated channels.
And then I suggest you to um, look again at the uh, schematic presentation of these main pathways. The slides are the same as you saw in the previous lecture, but I hope that it will be better to repeat this, because this is important to remember, to memorize. Please let's observe adenylate cyclase cyclic AMP mechanism. First, receptor is located in the plasma membrane of the cell and coupled with G protein inside. And when hormone molecule binds to the receptor from outside, inside GS protein becomes activated. For this pathway, it's GS stimulating protein. And it means that um, activated G protein means that alpha subunit is separated from others and moves and activates nearby located adenylate cyclase molecule. And then its cyclase enzyme starts to work and converts adenosine triphosphate molecules into cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And then, therefore, it's necessary to remove two phosphate groups, inorganic phosphate, PPI, inorganic, EI stands for inorganic. Then, cyclic AMP molecules activate protein kinase A. Actually, it means mm, it's achieved by binding to inhibitory subunits. The total amount of inhibitory subunits actually is four, and for each subunit, one cyclic AMP molecule is necessary. And when CAMP binds to inhibitory subunits, they become uh, the active subunits of protein kinase A become separated and become free, and so it means that protein kinase A becomes active. Active molecule begins their function, phosphorylation of proteins. It means that substrate proteins become phosphorylated using the phosphate taken from ATP. So ATP becomes converted to ADP, but phosphate is attached, transferred from ATP and attached to the protein. And if initially it was inactive enzyme protein, now it becomes activated enzyme. If it was structural protein, it changes its conformation so that it starts to perform its function in some necessary way. So they're depending on type of hormone, different substrate proteins are phosphorylated by protein kinase A, and then we can achieve somehow different uh, changes in different target cells. It's a very widespread pathway for many hormones. And let's see some examples of these hormones. Some of them we are going to study deeper later. So let's see. Adrenocorticotropic hormone. It's a pituitary hormone. Then luteinizin. All this uh, full first part of this list include the hormones produced in anterior pituitary. Luteinizin, follicle stimulating hormone, thyroid stimulating hormones. These hormones use a dynamite cyclase pathway. Then, this is ADH hormone from the posterior pituitary, actually it's produced in hypothalamus, and it may act through two types of receptors, and one type, V2 receptors, uses adenylate cyclase pathway. This type of receptors is located in kidney tubules. Then, adrenaline or epinephrine, when it operates through the beta-adrenergic receptors. It also uses adenylate cyclase cyclic AMP pathway. And glucagon, well known, operating through this pathway to activate glycogen breakdown into glucose in the liver monster. Then, let's observe again similar slide that we already had in chemical signaling for the phospholipase C inositol triphosphate mechanism. Here again, in the plasma membrane, we have the receptor protein coupled with G protein. But in this case, when hormone binds, it activates the GQ protein. And this protein is able to activate the, mem the phospholipase C enzyme. When phospholipase C enzyme becomes activated, it starts to split particular phospholipid available in the membrane, between membrane phospholipids. It's called phosphatidyl inositol phosphate. Well, number two indicates that diphosphate, actually, two phosphate groups it has. And when it becomes split, it produces two 
second messengers at once. Diacylglycerol that activates protein kinase C and inositol triphosphate IP3, which serves as the ligand for channels in endoplasmic reticulum, calcium channels. It opens these channels and calcium is released into cytoplasm. This calcium release, for example, when it's achieved in a smooth muscle cell, initiates the process of muscle contraction after some events. If it's the endocrine cell, it starts the process of exocytosis or release of the hormones. So mostly it uses used for smooth muscle contraction and also it can be endocrine cell secretion. So basically you may see each time when you have the contraction of smooth muscle under action of certain hormone, you practically can be sure that it's achieved through phospholipase C pathway activation. And so therefore you may um, suppose that vasoconstricting substances that operate through 7-TMS receptors all use phospholipase C pathway. And then adrenaline, when it produces vasoconstriction or epinephrine, the same, it uses, when it uses alpha adrenergic receptors, it uses phospholipase C pathway. Then angiotensin 2, according to its name, angiotensin, it, angion is the Greek root for vessel and tension it's clear for increased pressure so it's achieved through vasoconstriction. Angiotensin 2 is one of the most potent, vas potent vasoconstrictors in our body and it uses this uh, pathway, phospholipase C. Another vasoconstricting substance, but no, it's called antidiuretic hormone, but in high doses it produces vasoconstriction. It has even a second name, vasopressin. And vasopressin produced by different roots, but meaning it's similar to angiotensin. It produces vasoconstriction, thus increasing blood pressure. And it operates antidiuretic hormone, previously was mentioned in the, among the substances using pathway of adenylate cyclase, but it was through V2 receptors. Now V1, they suppress in one receptors, they are located in smooth muscles of vascular wall. So this ADH, in this case ADH, or better say vasopressin, produces vasoconstriction through phospholipase C pathway and contraction of vascular smooth muscles. Oxytocin, this hormone is well known for causing the uterus contraction, so it's also smooth muscle contraction, and therefore phospholipase C pathway should be involved. Then, number of releasing hormones. Releasing hormones is a group of hormones that is produced by hypothalamus and it stimulates the release of anterior pituitary hormone and some of them such as thyrotropin releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, growth hormone releasing hormone, achieve this through phospholipase C pathway. Maybe at the beginning not easy to memorize so many examples, but some of them can be memorized early and some we can memorize later while studying the other sections of physiology. Another group of hormones that use tyrosine kinase mechanism. Actually, this is not a big group of hormones that acts through these receptors. And the best examples are insulin, also insulin-like growth factors, which are not true hormones actually, but they operate through this pathway. And from previous lecture, perhaps you remember that many growth factors, uh, hemopoietic uh, growth factors, growth factors for nerves and so on, they are not hormones, but they use tyrosine kinase mechanism. Also prolactin growth hormone uses similarly this tyrosine kinase mechanism. For insulin, the picture shows the dimerization of two receptors, two one transmembrane segment receptors. So let's observe this sequence. As insulin is one of the best examples, we need to consider this particular case when we need to have two receptors connected. So first, 
binding of hormone to the receptors and which can contributes to dimerization. So like this, hormone molecule is in the middle. Then it results in activation of the inner portion of the receptors, tyrosine kinase. Now it becomes activated. And then the third phosphorylation begins because tyrosine kinase is active now. So it starts to phosphorylate proteins using the phosphate group taken from ATP. So this type of interaction, uh, of uh, conduction, of uh, influence of hormone to the inner side of the cell is faster operating and more precise because one molecule activates just one tyrosine, one hormone molecule activates just one kinase located inside and it acts um, only while the hormone molecule is attached. If hormone molecule becomes detached it immediately stops operation of the tyrosine kinase. So it enables to operate very quickly and very precisely and depending on amount of the hormone more proportionally. While 70 MS mechanism, as you may remember from previous lecture, involves the amplification because just one molecule of hormone results in production of many, many hormones molecules of the second messengers inside and second messengers activate many kinases so effect takes a longer time to develop if uh, one TMS receptors operate within seconds the mm, seven TMS receptors appear, operate within minutes at least few minutes are required to get the effect and this effect uh, not only lasts longer, but also it's much more powerful because many kinases operate at the same time. And even hormone molecule can be detached already, but the second messenger's concentration does not, begin, uh, does not become quickly decreased. And so the protein kinases continue to work longer time. Then we come to the next mechanism that involves the intracellular receptors operation DNA binding and protein synthesis mechanism this is this is for intracellular receptors and hormones that use this pathway through intracellular receptors are all of lipophilic nature so it includes big group of steroid hormones then thyroid hormones which are basically two of them T3 and T4 and Vitamin D3 also belongs to the hormones when it's active type. It's also called calcitriol and it's really considered to be hormone. So basically these substances, but this is a big group of substances and their mechanism is more or less similar. First, the lipophilic nature enables them to diffuse easily through the cell membrane. This is the first stage. Then they bind to receptor, cytosolic or nuclear receptor. If it's cytosolic receptor, then complex hormone receptor goes to nucleus to bind to DNA. If it's nuclear receptors, it, receptors, they are already bound to DNA and just when hormone comes to nucleus and binds to receptor, it re activates the next process. But then Regardless of uh, cytosolic or nuclear receptor, the general pathway goes similarly. Activation of DNA transcription, mRNA synthesis, and then on the basis of this mRNA, synthesis of proteins that provide the cell response. And depending on which type of proteins are formed, response can be very much different because it can be enzyme proteins, it can be structural proteins, transporting proteins, and so on. Numerous types of uh, and big variety of proteins. Intracellular receptors activation pathway, let's see again. And um, also this is a slide familiar for you. Diffusion first stage, then binding to cytosolic or nuclear receptors. Actually, if it's nuclear receptors, it's already located nearby, the, located on the DNA. And hormone complex receptor complex activates uh, DNA transcription. As a result, 
mRNA is formed and then it's moved and with ribosomes new proteins are produced. And again I remind you that the process of formation of proteins from zero level takes much longer time as any other type of receptors required for their function and their effects. And at least hours are required to get this resulting proteins enough amount for certain effect achievement. Examples of intracellular receptors and their ligands steroid and steroid hormones receptors and vitamin D. Let's see. Steroid hormones. Which uh, hormones are included? This is a big group of hormones. First, it's group that called glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids are few, but the main is the cortisol. Also, corticosterone exists, but cortisol is number one. Then, mineral corticoids. It's called like a group, but actually it has uh, only one representative, aldosterone. Then, group of sex hormones includes androgens with main representative testosterone and estrogens with main estradiol and progesterone. So all these hormones use predominant uh, use the cytosolic receptors. And as for thyroid hormones, which include triiodothyronine or abbreviated T3, and thyroxine or tetraidocyanin, which we simply can call T4. These two hormones are, these hormones use the nuclear receptors. You see, all steroid hormones are based on such a <laughs> nucleus that perhaps you remember from bioorganic chemistry with a very, very long name, cyclopentenoperhydrophenanthrel. This is a basis for cholesterol molecule. And on the basis of this cholesterol molecule, then the variety of hormones is produced. You see, they all, all look similarly, just with different uh, groups location and different uh, position of the double bonds. Look, glucocorticoids, cortisol here, then mineral corticoids, aldosterone is here. Sex hormones, both testosterone and estradiol are here, and progesterone as well. They all are based on cholesterol, so it's clear that they should be easily dissolved in phospholipids of membrane. They all use cytosolic receptors, I remind you, intracellular receptors. As for thyroid hormones, try iodothyronine T3 and thyroxine or tetraidothyronine T4. You see, they are based on the tyrosine amino acid, but their structure makes them lipophilic. And you may see that the, the only difference between the two hormones is missing one iodine atom in the triiodothyronine. They look very similarly, but somehow triiodothyronine T3 is much more powerful and its effect are, is stronger. Here let's observe again. Here it's shown that its thyroid hormone receptor is already located on the DNA, connected to DNA. T3 and T4 enter by simple diffusion the cell. Just T4 becomes changed by iodinase and one iodine atom is removed. Nevertheless, T4 is weaker. Thyroxine remains a weaker acting hormone as compared to T3, but uh, it looks, uh, according to the scheme, it can be thought differently. So then hormones bind to receptor located inside the nucleus, nuclear receptor, uh, attached to DNA. And it initiates the process of transcription of particular portion of DNA, which is necessary to formation of mRNA for further Mm. synthesis of new proteins and you may see these proteins mm, participate in very different processes in the body. These proteins are necessary, essentially necessary for central nervous system development. They are necessary for growth, for cardiovascular system regulation, for metabolism and so on. Many, many different processes. Then, last example, vitamin D. 
actually vitamin is more American type of pronunciation, vitamin is more British, so you can choose any as you wish. Let's consider it on British, for example. So, firstly, this vitamin is produced in the skin due to sun, sunlight, actually the, the ultraviolet rays that um, <coughs> contribute to the formation of this vitamin. But it's not still active type, which can be called hormone. And it's necessary to modify it somehow. And first modification occurs in the liver, where 1OH group is attached in 25th position and it's formed 25th hydroxy vitamin D3. But this substance again is not fully active and not hormonal, finally. And this final stage occurs in the kidney, where one more hydroxylic group is added in the first position. So therefore it becomes 125 dehydroxy vitamin D, vitamin D3 or calcitriol. So it can be said that it's a hormone of kidney. Of course its production starts earlier, but final active type of uh, molecule is formed in the kidney. And this calcitriol is very important for calcium in the body and mm, it acts on target organs that include the bone, intestine and kidney, but perhaps intestinal processes are most important. So intestinal absorption of calcium can be produced only in the by calcitriol. Calcium and phosphate ions um, are absorbed from intestine just in the presence of calcitriol. Otherwise calcium simply passes without any absorption. Of course it influences as well the kidney processes and the bone for calcium, but main is the function of stimulation of the intestinal absorption. So here we finish the general mechanisms of hormone action and come to the first particular part of endocrine system, which is hypothalamus and pituitary gland system. Hypothalamus is very small portion of the brain and pituitary gland is also very small, but these two areas are involved in regulation and control of many other endocrine glands in the body. Like we enlarged it, so schematically hypothalamus and pituitary gland is represented here. And hypothalamus produces hormones that control the anterior pituitary and through this anterior pituitary it controls many other endocrine glands. And also it produces hormones for the posterior pituitary. So, for the anterior pituitary, it releases regulating hormones, releasing, which stimulate release of hormones, and few, a few inhibiting hormones that inhibit re release of some of anterior pituitary hormones. And for the posterior pituitary, hypothalamus itself produces hormones, and then they come to the posterior pituitary and released from the posterior pituitary. So we see hypothalamus and pituitary gland or hypothesis are closely connected to each other functionally and structurally. Let's begin from the anterior pituitary hormones. Anterior pituitary and let's start from this one is for thyroid and it's called thyroid stimulating hormone TSH. You should know both full names and abbreviations. Then when thyroid stimulating hormone binds the cells of the thyroid gland, it stimulates secretion by thyroid gland cells of hormones T3 and T4, triiodothyronine and thyroxine, proportionally to the level of TSH. Another hormone, they all are called tropic hormones because they act on the peripheral exact areas, the places. And this first and second tropic acts on the adrenal cortex. And correspondingly, it's called adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH abbreviation. In turn, ACTH stimulates mostly cortisol secretion from adrenal cortex. Then there are 
hormones that regulate the sex glands secretion and they are two follicle stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH and under action of these two hormones the sex hormones are produced and secreted into blood androgens estrogens or progesterone then we have hormone that acts on the body as a whole not to peripheral endocrine gland growth hormone and it acts on the bone tissue muscle tissue and fat tissue and most um, important action of this hormone according to its name is the stimulation of growth which can be achieved by protein synthesis stimulation and one more hormone from anterior pituitary acts also not without stimulation of peripheral hormones secretion this is prolactin it stimulates gland but it's not an endocrine but exocrine gland which produces milk so it's not a hormone stimulation of milk production and secretion let's observe total number of these tsh acth pair of hormones fsh and lh growth hormone and prolactin so six hormones produced by anterior pituitary and i hope you understand the difference between the left side of tsh acth fsh lh they are function is stimulation of secretion of the peripheral hormones and you may notice that two lower located growth hormone and prolactin do not stimulate peripheral hormone secretion to be exact the growth hormone stimulates secretion of intermediate factors growth in insulin like growth factors in the liver or somatomedians but they are not uh, the same hormones anyway and generally growth hormone also it's not considered the um, factor um, for, for secretion of um, hormones of the peripheral gland so it um, anyway is different from TSH, A, ACTH and so on and it's important for the feedback regulation regulation by the negative feedback which we observe later so regulation of anterior pituitary hormone secretion by hypothalamus first hypothalamic neuroendocrine cells secret they releasing hormones to the hypothalamic pituitary portal system that consists of the two capillary beds i hope you remember something from anatomy but if not let's see this is un unusual for the body system but it's um, somehow analogically to the portal system in the digestive of course it's much smaller so first capillaries are located in hypothalamus then they join into venules finally they form a small portal vein similarly to the portal vein that carries blood coming from digestive tract to the liver so it's again after one capillary system in intestines it forms vein then this vein enters the liver and becomes again mm, broken into numerous capillaries and here first capillary system in hypothalamus mm, goes into portal vein and portal vein enters the anterior pituitary and again produces capillary bed and neurosecretory cells of hypothalamus we call really produces releasing hormones now we don't mention inhibiting factors we consider mostly releasing hormones but similarly inhibiting factors produce in the same way so releasing hormones are <coughs> hormones that stimulate release of anterior pituitary hormones so it's easy why they're called releasing hormones look they are released into first capillary bed but through portal vein they come to the second capillary system where they finally reach the cell endocrine cells of the anterior pituitary and bind to their receptors you can see but this binding produces stimulation of secretion of these peripheral endocrine cells now it's like peripheral for um, hypothalamus these are tropic hormones now produced and finally they will stimulate really peripheral endocrine glands and secreted into blood as you remember many of them are secreted under 
stimulation of the phospholipase C pathway, which stimulates exocytosis of hormones. So releasing hormones with blood reach the cells of the anterior pituitary endocrine cell and produce release of the next hormones, which are called tropic. And then these tropic hormones in turn stimulate peripheral endocrine glands, such as thyroid gland or the adrenal cortex or sex glands. Releasing hormones. Let's observe how it goes for the all types of hormones. General principle, hypothalamus produces releasing hormones, pituitary gland, tropic hormones, and peripheral endocrine gland, their final hormones. So, observe that these are abbreviations also necessary to, that necessary to remember. Thyrotropin releasing hormone. So it means that will stimulate this hormone stimulates release of thyrotropin. And thyrotropin is shortened version of the TSH. TSH is a too long thyroid stimulating hormone, so in short it can be called thyrotropin, and thyrotropin releasing hormone produces secretion of this thyrotropin or TSH. And TSH in turn stimulates T3, T4 secretion, thyroxine and triiodothyronine. Corticotropin releasing hormone. Again, this hormone stimulates release of corticotropin. It's a short for ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And this hormone in turn stimulates secretion of cortisol predominantly. Then gonadotropin releasing hormone. Here we have one releasing hormone for two different hormones produced by pituitary, anterior pituitary. Both follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, sorry, H they should be, and luteinizing hormone, they both are stimulated by gonadotropin releasing hormone. Then they stimulate secretion of estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone, or so on. And two more hormones, growth hormone, releasing hormone. Here it's a long name with rep repetitive usage of hormone word, but this is called like this. Growth hormone, releasing hormone, produces release of growth hormone, and prolactin stimulating factor. Here it's not called releasing hormone, but it's just an individual subtype. Prolactin stimulating factor stimulates secretion of prolactin. And you may, you may remember that these two hormones do not cause secretion of peripheral hormones. And now we can finally come to this negative feedback specific type of regulation. This feedback operates according to following principle. Peripheral hormone inhibits pituitary tropic hormone secretion and also inhibits even hypothalamic releasing hormone secretion. So it means that if we need to keep certain level, more or less constant level of peripheral hormone, we should use this negative feedback. If peripheral hormone concentration increases, it stops further stimulation of its secretion. Or if peripheral hormone concentration decreases, it decreases inhibition, so practically it's the same as stimulation of secretion. And as high peripheral hormone level produces stronger inhibition, we say that this is feedback of negative type. So the peripheral hormone secreted by peripheral gland inhibits pituitary secretion of tropic hormone and also inhibits hypothalamic secretion of releasing hormone. So it helps to keep steady or level of peripheral hormones. Is its excess inhibits stronger than on average and its deficiency inhibits less than usual. Therefore, it's a similar to inhibition or reversion and then reverse to the stimulation, depending on level of peripheral hormone. This is a negative feedback. Let's observe pre uh, examples. ACTH and cortisol secretion. Hypothalamus produces corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH. Anterior pituitary produces adrenocortic polytropic hormone ACTH and adrenal cortex in response secretes cortisol. 
cortisol level inhibits anterior pituitary and normal cortisol level just helps to keep normal steady level of ACTH and due to this slight inhibition of the CRH secretion it helps to keep normal level of CRH and excess of cortisol starts to inhibit stronger than normally therefore it suppresses CRH and ACTH secretion and it makes cortisol come back to normal if cortisol level decreases normally it in de decreases inhibition on both anterior pituitary and hypothalamus levels of both CRH and ACTH increases and they stimulate secretion of cortisol higher and cortisol comes back to normal so it's a classical negative feedback which is the normal basis of maintaining some parameter at the same level constant to the right side you can observe similar example for FSH and LH secretion and you see where negative feedback comes to both hypothalamus and to anterior pituitary which in case of excessive level of sex hormones inhibits stronger secretion of both gonadotropin releasing hormone and both gonadotropins which are FSH and LH then inhibiting factors were mentioned initially that we have releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones produced by hypothalamus but inhibiting factors or statins are not required when we have negative feedback and for all hormones with uh, stimulation of peripheral hormone secretion like such as t 3 t 4 or um, cortisol these peripheral hormones level are used as main inhibiting factors but let's recall that growth hormone and prolactin do not have opportunity to be regulated by the negative feedback and exactly these two hormones need to have inhibiting factors and these inhibitor factors or statins are present only for these two hormones and they inhibit secretion of hormones that do not cause secretion of peripheral hormones so there is no there is no possibility to be inhibited by negative feedback so somatostatin it's somatotropin releasing inhibiting hormone official abbreviation srif of hypothalamus inhibits secretion of growth hormone Actually, growth hormone also can be called by synonym somatotropin, somato body stimulation of many body processes, mainly of course growth. So somatostatin is inhibiting factor produced by hypothalamus to keep growth hormone normally. Somatotrop <coughs> there is growth hormone releasing hormone that stimulates and somatostatin inhibiting hormone that inhibits secretion of growth hormone from anterior pituitary then prolactin also can be stimulated by prolactin stimulating factor and can be inhibited from hypothalamus by prolactostatin or prolactin inhibiting factor PIF and um, this uh, substance was identified as dopamine and so now when it's necessary for example to suppress unnecessary lactation they use the substances that stimulate dopamine receptors in the hypothalamus and prolactostatin is formed and it inhibits unnecessary lactation then adrenocorticotropic hormone let's consider in more detail it acts on adrenal cortex it can be seen even from name adrenal corticotropic but adrenal cortex is a complex endocrine tissue let's make a small cross-section and observe the layers of adrenal gland as, all, uh, as a whole and adrenal cortex in particular first of course there is medulla portion and in this medulla uh, Mm, adrenaline and noradrenaline are produced but now let's concentrate on the adrenal cortex as you may study in histology it consists of the three layers very thin superficial glomerulus zone in latin it's zona glomerulosa but it, 
glomerulosome that produces aldosterone, then thick medial medium zone, fasciculate zone or zona fasciculata. It produces cortisol and exactly on this zone ACTH produces its main effect, main stimulating effect. So ACTH mainly stimulates cortisol secretion, but also it has sm small reaction on a reticular zone, zona reticularis, which is the inner zone closest to the adrenal medulla and here androgens are produced, sex hormones or androgens, and for all men and women, just in the man body, these androgens become converted finally to testosterone. So ACTH stimulates mostly cortisol secretion and also stimulates androgen secretion slightly. And additionally, it has some more effects, not only stimulating for secretion of other hormones to produce their final effects, but also own effects present. One of these own effects is stimulation of glycogen breakdown, so that blood glucose level increases. And similar, simultaneously, ACTH decreases sensitivity to insulin, so receptors to insulin become less sensitive so that glucose cannot be quickly suppressed and decreased. And also there is one more effect. In adults there is no melanostimulating hormone at all as compared to young ch children. And function of melanostimulation, formation of melanin in the skin cells is performed by ACTH because of very similar structure. So. ACTH contributes to formation of melanin in the skin cells and therefore it contributes to the skin pigmentation. Normally it doesn't produce uh, any changes of skin color, but we can notice this only when ACTH level is pathologically high and it's, if it's high long enough, we can observe in patients hyperpigmentation, excessive pigmentation of skin, it becomes darker than naturally. Then, let's observe the posterior pituitary gland hormones. As already been mentioned, the hormones of posterior pituitary actually are produced in hypothalamus. But why do we call these hormones a posterior pituitary? Because posterior pituitary is place where hormones are released into blood. Secretion into blood occurs within the posterior pituitary. Let's observe how it goes. Neurosecretory cells of, uh, that produce these hormones are located in hypothalamic, supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. And this nuclei produce vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone ADH and oxytocin and release hormones from the axons. So the neurons, neuroendocrine cells, produce hormones and secretion synthesis occurs somewhere in the body of the neurons. But then they are transported down the axons and these axons go exactly from hypothalamus into posterior pituitary. Of course here you can see represented only schematically, but you see nuclei with bodies of neurons are located within hypothalamus. But axons of these cells go down to the posterior pituitary. And only then they come to capillaries. So the place of secretion actually is posterior pituitary. That's why it enables us to say that these hormones are posterior pituitary hormones. But this is an unusual case and if you ask where hormones are produced, you need to choose hypothalamus. Where they are secreted from, you need to choose posterior pituitary. Let's see. Hormones are produced there, transported down the axons, and finally come to the axons ends, where secretion into blood occurs. And then with blood, these hormones may reach any target cells, which are located distantly. For oxytocin, this is uterus and milk ducts, the contraction and for ADH, which is produced predominantly in supraoptic nucleus, not perventricular, 
These are vascular uh, smooth muscles which can be contracted and so the name vasopressin implies this and it can be kidney tubules, distal tubules of kidney where the, this uh, hormone produces reabsorption of water. So let's come again to this V2 receptors in kidney. Maybe logically, more logically from one hand it could be V1 mentioned, but first it's better to understand that kidney effects are normal ADH effects. A regular dose of ADH stimulates kidney processes and uh, does not produce significant vasoconstriction. So V2 receptors respond to the hormone every day. And this occurs by stimulation of water reabsorption in renal distal, renal distal tubules and collecting ducts. Their diuretic hormone provides water channels formation out of aquaporins. And these water channels enables water to move through the distal tubules and collecting ducts walls back into the interstitium of kidney, and so reabsorption occurs. And in the absence of ADH, there is no water channels, and somehow these cells are not permeable for water entirely without ADH. So, antidiuretic effects because less water remains inside the ducts, inside the tubules, less water is lost with urine, antidiuretic effect. And you may imagine that in the absence or deficiency of these hormones, the effect will be not antidiuretic, but diuresis becomes very high. Water cannot be reabsorbed and then it can becomes lost from the body. But let's finish with receptors. We want receptors in vessels. When V2 operates through adenylate cyclase pathway and results in reabsorption of water, V1 receptors use phospholipase C pathway and contraction of smooth muscles in the vascular wall. So, name vasopressin helps to memorize this effect. And contraction of smooth muscles in blood vessels produces vessels constriction so that vasopressor effect is achieved. So, it means blood pressure increases. Vasopressin. And vasopressin effects uh, is achieved when level of hormone increases, which happens, for example, in case of a great decrease of blood pressure or blood loss or so on. ADH deficiency. This is important to understand. It's not very widespread, but it happens that somehow, due to reasons of traumatic damage or unknown reasons why when cells in hypothalamus that produce this hormone, predominantly supraoptic nucleus, cells become damaged and die and do not produce ADH or almost not enough produce. Then it produces the disease that is called diabetes insipidus. The common for both for two different diseases where diabetes means passing through, water passes through. In a diabetes related to excessive glucose, sugar diabetes or diabetes mellitus, problem is that excessive glucose cannot be reabsorbed, remains in the tubules, produces high osmotic pressure inside the tubules, and prevents water reabsorption, normal water reabsorption. So, great amount of water remains in tubules and is lost. But of course, it never is as great as it can happen in case of diabetes insipidus which is related, not related at all to glucose, but related to ADH deficiency. In case of full absence of ADH, both distal tubules and collecting ducts become entirely impermeable for water. Therefore, all water that remains in tubules is lost from the body and great loss of water requires constant drinking of corresponding amounts of water. So, loss of water produces dehydration and thirst. And both uh, high diuresis and thirst are symptoms that is characteri are characteristics for, characteristic, characteristic for both types of diabetes. Well, and, but if you compare a severe ADH deficiency, diabetes insipidus, it's a much greater loss of water, results in much greater loss of water, and correspondingly stronger thirst. But if person cannot drink similar amount of water, 
corresponding to lost can result in death very quickly. So these people require constant injections of ADH, at, um, hormone ADH uh, synthetic analog. Oxytocin, just a few words about this. It stimulates milk ejection and uterine contraction using phospholipase C pathway and IP3 formation with release of calcium that follow, followed by contraction of corresponding smooth muscles. And I hope for now it's enough. And then we come to growth hormone. Growth hormone produces its own action through um, action on many organs and tissues and additionally it acts on the liver and some other cells and produces secretion of insulin-like growth factors from the liver. But then these factors produce effects similar to growth hormone. Insulin-like growth factors. Main effects are, here I try to divide growth hormones effect and IGF effects, but generally you can mix everything because they're very much coincident. Not fully, but <coughs> number one effect can be said in few words. Protein synthesis in muscle stimulation. Or simply protein synthesis, because not only in muscle. Then it contributes also for lipolysis, so it contributes to lean uh, growth without um, fat. Then it stimulates increase of blood glucose by glycogenolysis, and glucose uptake is suppressed. So glucose increases and kept, keeps uh, kept longer time increased. And stimulation of production of insulin-like growth factors, which in turn additionally stimulate also protein synthesis in muscle, but also general linear growth, which involves bone here, and stimulates protein synthesis also in many organs, and organ size increases. When growth hormone is normal, all the growth processes go um, normally, and person has normal height and normal size of organs, and so on. But let's consider Process, when there is growth hormone excess. And here two possible consequences can occur. Gigantism and acromegaly. And what's the difference between these two processes? The problem is that growth, the process that can go for total body or for only some parts of the body, depending on age. In Ch children age until the puberty, all bones are able to grow. And if there is growth excess in early age, gigantism occurs, which, mean, which means that process of growth goes proportionally, ju just excessive. Here you see the example on the left side, two guys with uh, right side normal growth and the left side similar age guy with excessive growth, but you see the proportions are not distorted. It just simply like enlarged copy of normal person. But after puberty, growth areas in the bones become closed. And growth may continue only for such bones as skull, the hands, the feet, and um, not only bones, but inner organs internal organs can continue to grow and therefore if growth hormones excess develops in the people after puberty in adults it results only in growth of bones that are able to grow so longer bones lose the ability to grow therefore the total height of the person can be not very great and it can be as usual but not proportionally, the feet start to grow, then hands grow, and skull, like um, um, uh, facial bones, and also it grows of nose, ears, and in, uh, internal organs also, excessively large. So it increased growth of the body as a whole, or only distal parts. Acromegaly means acro, it's a distal acromegaly, enlarged distal parts of the body. 
they have increased organ size and if you remember about growth hormone it stimulates glucose elevation due to glycogenolysis so and uh, with <coughs> they can be produced glucose intolerance and in many cases they develop the secondary steroid uh, or not steroids or secondary diabetes may be produced in these people and actually many very high persons in the world they suffer from problems with glucose and with excessive organ size hepatomegaly and so on and opposite case deficiency of growth hormones also depend on when it develops if it develops in adult person the growth will not come back to lower height but there will be problems of protein synthesis in the body and so on but most uh, well known is the problem that appears early in young age and then growth really becomes not enough it's a so-called dwarfism when growth is not proportional and people have very short height they do not have only failure to grow they also have mild obesity because you remember growth hormone prevents uh, fat tissue formation it suppresses normally and also delayed puberty so there can be numerous problems also and with this I need to thank you for your attention at least most important hormones for today we consider it and the next lecture will be about most important hormones of peripheral endocrine glands.